Right. Is this Jordan? Jordan, John Michael. Is this one on? Can you guys hear me okay? No? How about now? Yay! Okay. So, I know that last month's, um, thank you. I know that last month's theme was transparency, but I just want to be clear about something, and that is that I realize I'm in a room full of, like, the smartest people, like, progressive tech people and famous architects and designers of all kinds, like up the wazoo. And then there's me, who has the technical capabilities that mirror like a suburban dad. So <laughs> fair warning. And you know, I practiced my speech in the Uber this morning, and my driver thought it, I was going to do great. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so yeah, full disclosure, there's, there's no uh, fancy transitions, there's no iPad, whatever, whatever. Up until this morning, I thought all of my slides would be distorted. Um, so really, my speech is just about these 60 cent cue cards from CVS that were gathering dust up until about two days ago when I bought them. Um, and I don't have it memorized, so I'm fucked if I drop any of these. <laughs> and uh, now that the first F-bomb has been dropped, I think we can go ahead and get started, right? So, hi, hello, good morning, happy Friday, I think you have to say that. Um, my name is Emily Belden, and some of you may know me as the author of this um, rated R best-selling memoir called 86. And others may know me from another project that I worked on, which was gluing 60,000 pennies all heads up to my bedroom floor, which sounds maddening, but I did end up going on the Today Show for that, which was an incredible opportunity to invite four million people into my home and show them what my crippling OCD actually looks like. <laughs> so if you unfortunately missed that segment, don't worry, you can go on Google, type in the penny floor and hit any link on the first four search pages and you'll see what I'm talking about. And if you've never heard of me until today, don't worry, I totally feel you on the newness of everything. I actually just learned this week that our president-elect is like some reality show host or something. I don't know. I, I'm sure we'll figure it out and we'll become you know, fast friends here and it'll, it'll all be fine. So given that this talk is actually pretty quick, um, I'm going to go ahead and get down to the creative mornings part of the morning. And as you already know, the uh, theme is fantasy. Now, when our gracious host, Nate, who sadly isn't here, when he contacted me to speak, he was so excited. Like, he was so emphatic and so passionate and so enthusiastic. He kept saying, like, you, this is you. You have got to do this. You know, you are the perfect person to speak on fantasy to a large crowd. You cannot say no. Fantasy is your subject. So, obviously, I was flattered, albeit a little bit terrified that he somehow had like a periscope into my bedroom nightstand because as it relates to fantasy I, mean, I can only speak for myself but I was incredibly moved by Fifty Shades of Grey <laughs> so um but after the initial bout of panic you know went away and I double checked that my bedroom wasn't bugged by Nate um I thought he probably extended the invite because I am an author and even though fantasy is not my genre by trade, um, I am contracted to write novels, fictional novels, uh, by the world's largest publisher, Harlequin. And so I get it, I get why he asked me, or at least I hope I get why he asked me. Um, now, novels are unlike my first book, which is a memoir, for two main reasons. The first is that when you write a novel, you don't have to worry about people stopping talking to you because you've outed all of their douchebaggery in a book that can be purchased pretty much anywhere. Um, and the second reason, which ties into the first, is that novels are different because they are made up. Um, and the content of my novels are a product of my imagination, which is oftentimes fueled by um, red wine and whatever is on Teen Mom. So, as I mentioned, Harlequin bought two novels from me. Crazy asses. Uh, the first one is going to come out next year, and it is called Burned. 
and it is set in the glamorous yet scandalous restaurant world. And it's, it's an unputdownable story about a 25-year-old girl who falls for an up-and-coming celebrity chef who also happens to be a not-so-recovering drug addict. And he convinces her to part with her life savings to get behind his restaurant concept. And a month before this hot Chicago restaurant is about to open, he relapses and vanishes and leaves her to navigate this all on her own and figure out the cutthroat fine dining scene for herself. Admit it, you're hooked. <laughs> So right now, I am in the editing process, which means the manuscript is already written, it's been fully acquired by the publisher, but they have now had a couple of months to sit with it, and their entire team has successfully ripped it to shreds. So in my inbox now is a 338-page redlined Word document ready for me to go and make a bunch of edits to. So if that doesn't sound daunting as fuck, I don't know what does. <laughs> But the thing about the feedback at this stage of the game is that it is not about put a period here or add a word here. It's about digging deeper, much, much deeper. You know, what is she thinking right here in this exact moment of this scene? You know, what is he wearing? Can we get a visual? Describe how she feels when she sees this or hears that. Is there room for a sex scene anywhere? <laughs> hey, this is the fantasy talk, okay? So every day for at least 12 hours, I sit in front of my computer and I get to work on answering these questions. And I go really deep, as deep as I can go, thinking about these characters. I want to know them so well that I could tell you what their favorite food was, or if they're a morning person, or do they listen to Nickelback? Spoiler alert, nope, not in my books. But you get it. You get it. I want to know all of the things that make them, them. So based purely on that description about what I do, I, by all accounts, am living in total fantasy world. I'm thinking harder and more critically about people who do not exist in situations that never happened than I ever have before. So like, without proper context, I get it, like I should fully like be committed to a psych ward. And it's weird because I get so invested in this stuff that it's actually hard for me to believe that once I close out of the document and that the story ends, that these characters aren't like living on beyond me in their own like la la land. Like I find that hard to believe, which I, again, like psych ward. But for as crazy as that sounds, I also remember how this industry works, publishing and book selling. And the fact is that there are billions of people around the world that spend money to and dedicate real time and brain cells to reading these stories, which means that they're you know, choosing to be engrossed in the fantasy. So I actually don't know who's crazier, to be honest. Now, I have been on both sides of this situation. So, for example, I remember on my 28th birthday, we were going on a boat. And I brought the book Gone Girl with me. And I thought, if there's you know, a lull in the action, I can read some of this book. Well, I made the mistake of starting to read the book before we went on the boat. And in just a few minutes, like I, I could not stop. I became obsessed with the twists and the turns and the characters and the story. To, so much to the point where I declined blowing out the candles of my own cake and I told someone else that they could do it because I wanted to finish the chapter, which till this day remains the most antisocial, not to mention rude thing that I have ever done. And also it's like reason 172 that you should never date a writer. So warn, be warned. But spending all of this time in these other worlds has absolutely got me thinking about fantasy. You know, and if you strip out the whole Dungeons and Dragons theme and you're absolutely sure you're not talking about kinky sex, right, Nate? This is not about, okay, good. Then what is fantasy? And more importantly to this talk, how do you become inspired by fantasy? 
So now I'm going to do something crazy and see if my slides work. So um, before I go to the next screen, let me give you a little bit of context about what I did. I um, did a very informal, very unprofessional poll, very a la CNN. Um, and I asked my social media followers what their fantasy was. So side note, don't just say what's your fantasy and then put that out in the ether and not expect to get like horrifying responses. Um, but anyhow, here are a couple of responses from some of the brave souls that um, tweeted me back. So Mindy uh, Resnick Belser says, a steady paycheck from a job I don't hate. And Teva Bingham says, waking up and my student loans have been mysteriously paid for. Bonnie Bost Keen says, a good night's sleep, which I have not had since October 3rd, which I assume that's because her child was born, but that seems like <laughs> really negative. And then we have Bruce Hartford at the bottom there who says, healthy donuts that taste like fucking donuts. <laughs> so I guess I can't really like, that's a good one. So um, now I have to admit though that I was actually a little, a little bit disappointed by these. Um, and luckily, some rando tweeted me in like the 11th hour, this amazing -ness. <laughs> So now I'm actually, I'm actually going to leave this up for the duration of the speech, so you're welcome. <laughs> you're welcome. Um, all right, so you might be wondering, though, why though, why was I disappointed about those first for, you know, the submissions about the shitty jobs and the loans and the lack of sleep and the deceptive donuts. And the reason is that they are actually really all the same. And it proved something to me about fantasy that I've kind of thought for a while that, I, that just pisses me off, actually. And, and that's that society today has made fantasy a term of deflation. And it's actually a negative descriptor now. And so if you're not getting what I'm saying, let me give you an example. How many of you have ever heard or said something like this? Well, in a fantasy world, the client would have, you know, done one round of revisions and compiled it, but in reality, you know, there are a bunch of crackheads, this is a hot mess, and apparently they want to design the website themselves. Because <laughs> I, I have, I come from agency life, I totally get that. So, now I get why the word fantasy is used to contrast reality in a negative way. You know, it's the whole you got to know dark to know light. When they go low, we go high. I get, I get why there's the, the contrast. But what would happen if we stopped using fantasy as a point of comparison and instead use fantasy as a point on a map and, a, you know, consider it a place that you want to be? And a place where you want to be sometimes so bad that you would die trying to get there. Now, if we can all agree that fantasy is good, fantasy is people happy, things working out, stuff going right, you know, donuts tasting the way that they should, then why the hell don't we demand more from fantasy? So when I started writing 86, we're going to go back. I was 23 years old, and I was sharing a dilapidated apartment in Lincoln Park, Chicago, with two roommates who offered me no privacy. I didn't have a desk, I didn't have a chair, because I could not afford either, and I was working a nine to five, so when I would come home, I would lay in my bed and put the laptop on me, and I would type sometimes until two or three in the morning, or until my stomach was starting to burn because the hard drive was overheating, I mean, there is nothing glamorous about that. I get it. And if someone looked at me in those moments and said, what is this? What do you do? What are you doing here? What's the fantasy here? I would have stopped them, and I would have corrected them, and I would have said, you mean what's the point here? Because I have always been the person to demand more from fantasy. So for as young and naive as I was at that point, I still knew exactly what I wanted to have happen. You know, I wanted this to go from a Word document to a paperback. I wanted my name to be on the cover it. I wanted you to be able to buy it in a store or, or on Amazon or at a speech like this. 
and I wanted people to take selfies with it, and I wanted them to find me on social media and tell me just how spot on my view of hand jobs really are. <laughs> so I get that all of that sounds really lofty, right? Like it sounds just like the dream. And and so easy to categorize it as the fantasy compared to the reality. But I was also determined that that was not going to be my fate. Not with this one, because it was too important to me. Now, a fantasy is only as good as your desire to live it. And my desire to live this one was strong. So I stopped looking at fantasy as something that's up here, just up here, and reality is something that's down here, and that this area here, this no man's land, we just, we don't, we don't go there, you know. Because when you look at some, if you look at fantasy as something that's up here, I mean, yeah, no shit, that's a lot of steps, that's exhausting, you know, that's time, that's energy that I don't have. So what are you supposed to do then? Well, I'll tell you. You stop looking at this as an uphill battle. And instead, you figure out how do you close the gap by bringing fantasy to you. After all, the dream is that fantasy becomes the reality. It's not the other way around. So the question is, how do you pull it in? What's the first thing you got to do to bring it just a tiny little bit closer to you? So for me, it looked like this. OK, the manuscript is done. It's written, it's typed, now what? Okay, so I researched and I asked around and I found out the next step is you write a proposal. All right, you can do that. Now what, what's next? I learned that it's looking up an agent. All right, well, I have Google, I can do that. Now what? And so on and so forth. I kept asking and answering these questions myself that would help me close this gap. And eventually, not soon, but eventually, there was a critical mass where I started to see the pieces of the fantasy actually become the reality. I will never forget the email that I got that said, we would like to talk to you about acquiring your manuscript. And I will never forget the email that came through with the cover designs from the art department. And I'll never forget getting flowers delivered to my door on my pub date because all of these tangible things were proof to me that the fantasy had become the reality. Now, this is not to say that when you simply break it down into tiny little, you know, little things, you can just accomplish anything. This is not a recipe for overnight success by any means. But instead, this is a prescription for at least some change in a direction I think we all want to go. You know, for me, even doing things exactly the way that I describe, you know, step by step, ask and answer, this still left me rejected more times than I could count. You know, I still was crying on my bathroom floor when a New York editor said she wasn't vibing me. But I never let any of that convince me that the fantasy wasn't meant to become the reality. Now, earlier I described that fantasy is a place where we all want to be. So all that this rejection and disappointment did was tell me that I need to stop, back up, and try a different path to get there. It showed me that the string that I thought that I was supposed to pull to close that gap, it just, it wasn't the one. So I had to go another route. You know, I contacted a different agent, or I tweaked the proposal, or I edited the first chapter so it had a stronger hook. I, I just, I tried a different string. And it's true. It's true that fantasy is not reality, but it's also true that fantasy is not impossible. And as a room full of young, talented, smart, motivated people, I think that we have a responsibility to do our part to bring as much fantasy into reality as we can. And why? Because it makes our jobs easier. It gives, it gives your life some enrichment. It makes it more exciting. It inspires others to push harder. And it gives people a sense of purpose. I mean, take a look at the world right now. I mean, can't we use more of all of that? 
Now, one of my favorite things about fantasy is that you actually never know the moments that start as so, so small and menial and oftentimes forgetful, but are actually the foundation for some of the big highlights of your life. And so I asked my agents, two people that know me and my story very well, what they perceived the fantasy was for me, their client. And again, I found their responses interesting. So 86 is more than just a book about horrific dating. It's, you know, as with most things in life, there is a deeper meaning and a bigger purpose and a lesson. And so the real meat of this story, which is the point that my agents identified as that fantasy maker for me, it's, it's also the point in this book that gave me the inspiration to turn around and write Burned and to sell that to Harlequin this year. And it all started with a story that's in this book about a dinner that I sat down to have in January of 2011 at a restaurant called Alinea. And for anyone who knows what Alinea is, you know that it's the best restaurant in North America. It's got three Michelin stars, 20 plus courses per meal. The price tag, I don't even know what it is, but it, it's grotesque. And when I left that place, I, I was in awe, absolutely. But in no way, shape, or form did I think, this is it. This is the point, this is the launch of my career. One meal out of all of the times that I have sat down to eat in my life, one meal inspired me. It moved me, it stuck with me, it propelled me. And now look. So who's to say that something just like that hasn't or can't happen for you? So before I wrap, there's a few things that I want to recap, a few jobs that I have for you in the way of fantasy. The first one is, to keep your eyes open for the moments that could make your fantasy a reality. Don't pass up the ordinary because it feels too insignificant to matter. A dinner that I had so long ago became all I needed in the present day to write a hell of a story that a publisher couldn't wait to get their hands on. Number two, don't take obstacles as life's way of telling you that something's not meant to be. This is part of the process. So you just have to try again and pull another string. And doing that is actually much easier than giving up and acting like you're going to be totally OK living your life without a fantasy. Three, spend at least five minutes a day in a fantasy world. I spend 12 hours there myself. And like I mentioned, but that's because I have to. But even when the edits are done, and my plate is clear, I am going to miss taking my brain on a vacation like that to a world where there are no political commentators and no violence and no sickness. You know, I think you can make your fantasy world whatever you want it to be. And so I'm not a doctor, but I feel like that's healthy to go there. Trust me. <laughs> and finally, be super patient, like really fucking patient, because if your fantasy is a bigger thing, like putting a book out or getting published, you know, it can take several years, and it did for me. But my God, when you finally close that gap and you're standing at a place like this and you're looking back and thinking about the time that your laptop burned your upper inner thigh because you were writing in your tiny ass apartment until 3 a.m., it's just the sign that the fantasy has become the reality, and that feels so great and so worth it. So this picture was taken in a split second, as fast as it takes to click you know, the button on the iPhone. But in reality, it took me seven years to snap this photo. You know, when I arrived at this author's ceremony for Harlequin earlier this summer, I tried to take an awkward selfie with it just so I could send it to my mother. But then this stranger, this woman, walked by me on her way to the bathroom and she was like, can I take, do you want me to take that photo? And I said, sure. And, and that was it, it was so menial for her, she'll never, she, no way she's still thinking about this. Like, but this picture means more to me than probably any other picture that I have. So here's a scoop. That's it on the talk. We're gonna start Q&A now. Um, I asked that if you have a specific question about publication or writing, about a project you're doing, just come find me after 
or if you want to grab a book and you don't want to wait for Amazon to deliver it, come find me after. Or if you want to confess your deepest, darkest fantasy, just lean over and whisper it in the ear of the person sitting to the right of you, because <laughs> I don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> for now, I'll go ahead and open up the floor to some general Q&A. Thank you.